Hey everybody, this is Pamela. And this is Tracy. And we are here to discuss how business really works. Today we're going to be answering a question. Do you need a mastermind, a coach, a mentor, or an accountability partner? Well, the answer is yes, and you know I'm going to say that. But <laughs> the real reason is why, what's the difference, which one's best for different stages of your business, and which one's best for different problems. Well, we'll start with the why. The main reason you need one of those four is that you can't really rely on friends and family. You probably think you can. You probably have an awesome friends and family. They're supportive. But what you're going to actually find is when the going really gets tough and when you really need to buckle down, these are people who care about you. They care about how you feel. They care about your happiness. And sometimes they're going to, they're going to let you slide. They're also going to, they're not going to be that hard on you. They're probably not going to say what really needs to be said because they don't want to hurt you. What do you think, Pamela? I mean, do you find that you can really rely on your friends and family to be hard pushing and to get you over the hump? No, I mean, <laughs> sorry, friends and family, I really am. But, and I know that my friends and family love me. There is absolutely no question in my mind. But I think what you said is absolutely true. They are my friends. They are my family. They don't want to strain their relationship with me. And frankly, you know, it's kind of not their job to push me where I want to go in life. It's their job to love me and be my friend and be a shoulder to cry on and, and I for them. But I feel like what you said is true. They won't want to strain the relationship and really get on your butt about things. I know there are some friendships where it is that way. And I think those are not the norm. Very valuable friendships anyway, but not the norm. But mostly people just, you know, they want to have a good, positive relationship with you. They don't want to be on your case about things. And it changes the dynamic of the relationship. So yeah. I am almost thinking to myself as I'm working this out out loud that it's almost really not fair to put your friends and family in that position unless maybe you do have one of those rare relationships or friendships where you really can get on each other's case and it's okay. That's what I think. I have some business friendships that are that way. But none yeah, of sure. my personal friendships or family are that way and then like you take my mother and she's meaning well she really is but if she sees you really trying to um push the envelope of your limits mm -hmm. she will very kindly discourage you because she doesn't want to see you fail right yes and that is another danger i think your friends want to keep you safe your family wants to keep you safe that's their job that's their job Throughout the ages in evolution is parents keep their children safe from harm. So they're definitely not going to want you to put yourself in harm's way and possibly fail. Mm -hmm. But that's not good for succeeding in business. You have to fail to succeed in business. You, it's just a rite of passage. Exactly. Well, you get to put, decide whether you put that fail label on it. You know, you're in business. You're going to do things. Some are going to work out. Some aren't. You get to decide right. whether we're going to label that failure. It's like we say in the business success rule. If it doesn't work, tweak it, change it, mm -hmm. try it again. There's no reason to use the label failure. I think even if you had a business that ceased to operate, as long as you continue on in business and you try something else, you had something that didn't work out. I'm not a big fan of the word failure. Okay, fair enough. Let's um, discuss now what the difference in the four are. You have accountability partner, mastermind, mentor, and coach. So let's start with accountability partner. I think it's very obvious what that is. It's that person that you talk to on a regular basis, daily, weekly, bi-weekly, however long it should be, where you say, this is what I'm going to accomplish, and this is what I did accomplish. And somehow that person is supposed to hold your feet to the fire if you didn't accomplish it. Mm -hmm. So, does that work for you, Pamela? Absolutely not. And here's why. There's two reasons. First of all, how are they really going to hold your feet to the fire? 
for instance, if you haven't hired them to work for you, to do that for you, like a coach would be doing, then what are they going to do to hold your feet to the fire? They're just going to kind of shame you, maybe <laughs> remind you to get your stuff done. But that's really the limit of their power is just those kinds of social pressure things. And maybe that works for some people, but I feel like it doesn't really work for a lot of people. But also what I have found with accountability partners, and I've tried this with people in the past, it sounds like a great idea in the beginning and everybody's gung ho about it. And then when it comes time to actually follow through and plan things and get on each other's case about getting things done, nobody does because they all are too busy with their other things. Whereas if I'm hiring a coach, that person can be an accountability partner for me because that's that person's job. That's his or her job. Mm -hmm. Now they are accountable for keeping you accountable. So I don't think accountability partners generally work out. Again, I'm sure there are exceptions to this rule and they are the rarer, more rare cases, but I don't know. I feel like it's just a waste of time. Yeah. And I think it does depend on your personality some. If you're the type of person that you just can't say I'm going to do something and fail to do it, mm -hmm. the embarrassment is enough to hold you unaccountable, then an accountability partner will work. And it's funny... If I say I'm going to do something for you or for an organization or whatever, I'm going to do it come hell or high water. I'm going to, have to do yeah. it even if I'm having to lay on my back in the bed doing it. I just can't <laughs> not do it. But if I tell you I'm going to do something that's going to move me forward, my business forward, and two weeks later you ask about it and I go, nah, I didn't get that done yet. It's not embarrassing to me. Mm -hmm. It's I failed myself, not anybody else. So yeah. An accountability partner in that regard doesn't work for me, and I don't think it works for a lot of people. Well, here's, here's where I think an accountability partner can work, and that is when you both have the same stakes in the situation. But then you're maybe not accountability partners. Maybe you're actually trying to build a business together or do a project together. But when one person has all the stakes and the other person's just there to be the cheerleader or the observer or what have you, there's no skin in the game there. There's no reason for them to keep you accountable. <laughs> exactly. There's two situations I've personally been in in which accountability partner worked. But the accountability partner was not a person. It was money. It was greenbacks. It was the hard stuff. Oh, and interesting. what it was is I was involved in a mastermind group and we had a rule. If you failed to do what you said you were going to do outside of like extremely rare circumstances, such as, you know, you were in a coma for a week. <laughs> you had to put $50 in a pot. Wow. 50 bucks, 50 bucks. But see, here's the thing. It benefited us all too. Cause we did a, we were virtual over the internet. Um, we did a call every week but twice a year, we had a retreat and got together. And that cost money. Mm -hmm. Most of us had airfare involved and that sort of thing. So the $50 went toward paying for the retreat. But if you put $50 in, it couldn't pay for your part of the retreat. It paid for the other four people. It went oh. toward their expenses to get to the retreat. Oh, very good. So in that regard, yeah, that money made me work mm -hmm. <laughs> no question I did not want to pay for anybody else's retreat all right so the next one will be mastermind and we just kind of touched on that one of the positive aspects of a mastermind but I think one of the reasons a mastermind is so important and I think everyone should be in a mastermind not at some point in your life, not at some point in your career and in your business growth, but at all times. But you don't need to stay in the same mastermind. You need to move to different masterminds because two important things about a mastermind. One, it should be your peers, not mm -hmm. people who are further advanced than you, that sort of thing. It needs to be your peers, people that are working in the same segment of business you are. So if you're a startup, you need to be in a startup mastermind. If you're 
like at a growth plateau and, and right now growth is what's most important, then you need to be in a mastermind that focuses on that. And I'm not big on industry specific masterminds because I think sometimes people hold themselves back thinking of these other people in the mastermind as a potential competitor. Oh yeah. yeah. Now it works fine if you're in a regional based business and you're working with people who are, have regional based businesses in other areas of the country. So like, say like a real estate agent, that would work great. If you're in some sort of entertainment where like theater, where you're centrally located and your audience is centrally located, it'd work great. But if you're in online marketing based business, everyone's a potential competitor. So I think it's more interesting if you're, you have similar aligned businesses, but not the same business where you would be going after the same exact customer. So that's two things you want to think about when it comes to masterminds. But the main reason you need a mastermind goes back to this concept that I think it was Jim Rohn that came out with this, um, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time around. Yes. All right. Well, if you've got five people in a mastermind that have the same goals of achievement that you do, and you're spending time with these people, it's going to cause you just to naturally achieve more. It's just human nature. And this is really important, especially if your friends and your family and stuff are not business owners. They don't understand what you're going through. It's just a lot easier to have these other people that you work with and not having those conversations so much with friends and family. Keep those conversations more friends and family conversations. Right. So I'm a strong proponent of masterminds. I think they're vitally important. But I've been part of a couple of masterminds that really have failed. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. Pamela and I actually initially met in a mastermind. Mm -hmm. See, something good came out of it. We met each other. (laughs) We met each other. You got Mm -hmm. a lot more focused, that sort of thing. But two things went wrong with that mastermind. One, we didn't set up strong enough ground rules about what's not allowed. Yes. uh, About participation. Mm -hmm. um, That sort of thing. And basically... You're out if you can't participate or don't participate. Mm -hmm. It sounds cruel that, like, you know, you're in a car accident, you're laid up for weeks at a time, that you can't be in the mastermind anymore because we need someone else in there. But you do. You need someone else in there. If that person can't be in the mastermind, you just need to accept that, and you need to get another person in the mastermind. Because basically what happened with this mastermind that Pamela and I were in is we lost a member. Mm -hmm. And we had another member that wasn't fully participating. And as a result, it just fell apart. I find that once you get down to three people, masterminds usually fall apart. If one person can't participate one week, all of a sudden you just got two people sitting around talking. So you need a way to constantly be sourcing new members. And you need really strong ground rules going into a mastermind. I'm going to have a checklist uh, that you can download from the website that's going to give you kind of ground rules for setting up a mastermind, how to find people to be in your mastermind and that sort of thing. So be sure and hop over to the website and check that out. Yeah, I think that'll be really valuable because with this whole surge in entrepreneurship, everybody wants to be accountable, have an accountability partner, join a mastermind, do all these things. And they get into the situation that you and I were in where it didn't work out for these reasons, various reasons. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think if they can avoid some of the traps that you and I have experienced, that'll be so much better for them. Yeah, and I think one of the rules you need to have is this is not a place to come in and complain, either about business or about your personal life. And yes, when things are going wrong, those (laughs) things affect your ability to produce and all, but that's not what you need to be focused on. You're focused on the solution, not constantly talking about the problem. Right, exactly, exactly. I think the perfect size for a mastermind is four to six people because you'll hear a lot of people say up to 10 people and you even hear these like mega masterminds. But Mm -hmm. I think once you get above that sixth person, you get to the point that there's not enough time for everybody. There's diminishing returns at that point. Yeah, I mean, even if you do a hot seat, think about it if you spend a certain amount of time, just general conversation, and then you put one person on the hot seat, by the time you get around to that person again, six weeks has passed. Oh, yeah. I like smaller masterminds, but 
four is the minimum. I like four to six. That to me is just the golden. All right, so then mentoring and coaching. Now, a lot of people think these are the same thing. There's a lot of what are technically business coaches out there that are calling themselves mentors. But there's one very big distinction between mentoring and coaching. Mentoring is where you have an expert that you can call on for a specific problem. They help you. They teach you. Most of the time, this is free. I, throughout my career, have had numerous mentors. I worked with one person who was a marketing whiz, and that's who I went to with my marketing problems. But I didn't go to him with financial questions, employee questions, human resource-related questions. He was my expert in that area. And I had other people that were the people I went to to ask questions in other areas such as employee, that sort of thing. And I think that's the big distinction is a business coach is someone you pay to coach you, to motivate you, to help you focus, to get you from one point to another point. Whereas a mentor is a, hopefully you have, I had dozens of mentors over my lifetime, but at any one time I would say I probably had three to four that I called on. How did you find your mentors, Tracy? Well, all, in the case of the mentors I had, they were either leaders in the industry I was in or they were business leaders in the community I worked in. So like the marketing expert, he actually owned a chain of automobile dealerships and mm-hmm. he just, he was brilliant at marketing. And that's one thing, marketing one type of business you would think is different than marketing another type of business, but it's really not. The principles, to a great degree, are the same. And yes. you can learn concepts from another industry and apply it to your industry that will set you above all your competitors. So it's very important that you use people that aren't specifically in your industry. Now, coaching, I like in business coaching. Business coaching is very different from life coaching. Sorry, I'm going to step on a few life coaches' um, <laughs> toes out there because they're going to tell you that it's all about bringing the best out in you and we don't really have to know anything about business. But I think business coaching is a lot more like sports coaching. You need to know something about that sport. You really do. Mm-hmm. Now, do you have to have been the fastest runner in order to coach someone as an Olympic runner? No, but you have to know running. Just because you physically weren't capable of being the Olympian doesn't mean you can't coach the Olympian because you know the sport inside and out, you know the politics of the sport, and you have trained yourself on the mental aspects of the game, and therefore you can be an Olympic athlete or you can be an Olympic athlete trainer, coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, all great athletes, all of them, have coaches. The best golfers in the world have usually four to five coaches on their team. The best tennis players average three coaches. Really? Yes. Interesting. So I didn't realize they had more than one. Yes. Most Olympic athletes have multiple coaches. Think about most sports teams. They have Mm -hmm. multiple coaches. And here's the interesting thing that I always wonder about people. Now, you think it's all right for your kids' peewee league to have multiple coaches, but you as a business owner trying to build a company doesn't need one? Really? I would say yes. I I think so. You need mentors, you need coaches, and you need mastermind. And sometimes you need multiple. You'll hear of a lot of... um, business owners that are in multiple masterminds and use multiple coaches and all of them use multiple mentors it's interesting Brene Brown said that the most dangerous thing that you can do is assume that people reach their success on their own because they don't they use the mind power of multiple people to be successful you know Jamie Tardy that wrote The Eventual Millionaire Yes. She interviewed 70 millionaires to write that book. And she said the one common factor they all had was the use of masterminds, mentors, and coaches. And they had all of those. 
they had all of those in different times and different stages and that sort of thing throughout their career, but they always used those resources. So that's something I have not been doing right. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm thinking actually about my YouTube channel and how I could apply this to that, because that is something I would like to grow into a business, as we know. Mm -hmm. And you've definitely been helpful as far as, I guess, both mentoring and coaching. I find virtual mentors in others online on YouTube who have done what I want to do. So they don't speak to me personally, but I follow their work. And I also follow their how-to videos if they put them out. Um, so I guess you could count, could you count that as a virtual mentor or no? Because they are giving advice on how to do the thing that I want to do. They're just not talking to Pamela. They're making a general a video for their audience about it. I consider that more of a learning tool. And the reason being is because they're not specifically giving you advice on your specific situation. Now, they do do that. At least the couple people that I'm thinking of do offer individual coaching. Um, I just haven't wanted to go down that road just yet. But I Mm -hmm. may. That may be the next step for me. Yeah. I think that is very important. I mean, one, why do all the trial and error yourself when there's an expert out there who can help shorten that learning curve for you. Right, right, yeah. I don't know. I guess there's this, like, opinion. Is it an opinion? I don't know what it is. But people act as though if I get help, it means I'm weak. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I say put on your big girl panties and suck it up, and (laughs) this is about what's best for your business. Mm-hmm. Not about what's best for your ego. I agree. If you're stuck, you need a fresh perspective. Mastermind. If you're challenged with a specific problem, this is where a mentor or a coach can come in. Sometimes masterminds can help, but these are usually people that are your equal peers. You're all working on the same goal. That would be more of a situation for a mentor or a coach. And if you're having you know, issues with knowing Where should I be spending my time? What's the best use of my resources? How do I take this huge goal and break it down into manageable parts? If you don't know how to do all those things, this is when you hire a coach. When you've hit a wall, when your business has plateaued, you hire a coach. Even startups, if you're feeling overwhelmed and there's so much that you could be doing, but only so many hours for you to do this mm-hmm. is when you hire a coach you hire an expert that can break it down and say this is where you're going to get the most bang for your buck this is what you need to be concentrating on right now it's not that we're saying don't do all the other things we're saying that's in the future right now today this is where your focus needs to be this is what you need to be working on you don't need to be trial and error figuring those things out yourself Why take two years of trial and error to figure it out when you can pay some, a little bit of money? I mean, a lot of people think coaches are expensive, but if you spend $5,000 on a coach this year and that coach gets you from zero revenue to tens of thousands of dollars in revenue, was that not a good investment of your money? Was that not a good ROI? Oh, absolutely. Almost all executives, CEO level executives in major corporations use coaches. Yeah, you're trying to be a CEO of your business. Do what all the big CEOs do. Hire a coach. Good advice. So, Pam, I know you've been through coaching because, one, you hired me as a coach at one point. Yes. (laughs) What was your experience with coaching? It was really good. You specifically, as we stated before, you helped me focus. You helped me um, with some specific tasks that I needed to get done. I have very limited experience, frankly, outside of that. I have the mastermind experience that we talked about and coaching with you. I can only liken my experience to endeavors outside of business, so like acting. Um, Obviously, if you want to learn to be a good actor, you have to learn. You have to go to class. You have to get somebody to coach you individually, all of which I have done Mm -hmm. over the years in acting. And so I think it's the same principle. I'm not going to become a better actor 
unless I learn the proper techniques, I learn wisdom, I learn what works and what doesn't and why. There are different schools of thought about acting just like everything else. So learning the different schools of thought and how they may work together is helpful. Um, so in, in the acting world, it has absolutely made a difference, no questions asked. I look at some of the acting that I did, if you want to call it that, <laughs> before I actually started to get into class. Oh boy, I did not know what the hell I was doing. And it shows, it shows on camera. I just thought it would be fun to do, and I was cast in a couple things, and then I thought, okay, if I'm going to really give acting a try, I, I have to learn how to do this properly. And so I started educating myself and going to classes, and the difference in how I can perform a role now versus back then is just light years away. And I think it's the same thing in business. If you don't exactly know how to start, or maybe you have some idea, there's still so much that you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And a coach will help you get there, whether that is an individual coach like Tracy helped me or a mastermind group. There's always more that you don't know. Don't assume that you can just figure out the answers. And I know actually, I'm, it sounds like I'm going against some advice that we gave in previous episodes where we have both said you can learn anything you want to learn, right? You can um, learn anything online. you want to learn. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't mean that you can be the best without getting a coach. You know, well, I can go ahead. It's not that a coach takes away the learning curve. A coach can mm -hmm. shorten the learning curve. Yes, 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 yes. But I would even go a step farther than that. Now that I've used acting as an example, I can certainly learn basic acting techniques. And in fact, I could probably learn advanced acting techniques by watching YouTube videos. And maybe I'll learn at the same pace as, uh, as an in-person class. But the difference is that when I'm coaching with an acting coach one-on-one, -on -one, that person is giving me feedback on my performance. They're telling me what works. They're telling me when I had a brilliant moment. All that stuff, I can't see myself. Even if I record myself and watch it again, they're seeing things in my performance that I may not. Maybe because I'm too self-conscious. Maybe because I have a low self-esteem. <laughs> you know, They're giving me feedback that it would be very difficult to see in me. And maybe acting is unique in that way. I don't know. But yeah, so I, d I don't want to discourage people from trying to learn anything they want to learn online. You totally can. And I am not, not contradicting the advice we've given in the past. But I think there are times when a coach can either shorten the learning curve, as Tracy has said, or give you feedback that only a live person and a live interaction can give you. Exactly. Just like an actress needs an acting coach. A sports person needs a coach in their area of sports. A business person needs a business coach. You're never going to work at your peak performance level without one. Mm -hmm. David Osborne, who wrote Wealth Can't Wait and is the owner of the largest Keller Williams agency in the world, has like mm. 4,500 agents under him. He said wow. nothing... Nothing brings more purposefulness to your life and business than hiring and paying for someone whose sole responsibility during your time together is to hold you accountable and facilitate your success. Your life is worth that level of purposefulness. thought that was a great quote. And even though I'm not big on accountability partners, a coach does make a great accountability partner for the simple reason you're paying them. And they have a vested interest in your success right because if you're not succeeding they are not succeeding and I would also piggyback on what you just said make sure that if you are paying someone they're not just doing it for the money honestly I have had one or two acting coaches that they were good but I felt like I could give a shitty performance and yeah they would help me improve it but they weren't invested in me they didn't seem to really care what my ultimate outcome was. They were just kind of doing it because they needed to. Maybe they needed the money. Maybe they were trying to establish their name in the industry. Who knows what it was? But just money alone, of course, is a great motivating factor. It's now they've got skin in the game, as we were saying earlier. But if it's only money, then I don't think that's a good sign either. I agree. Now, how do you go about hiring a good coach? You know, Patrick Beck Davis did that video on YouTube. I will link to it 
where he mm-hmm. talked about the type of experts and how to evaluate an expert. And he called it his T theory, T-E-A. And he said, you have people that are experts on theory. These are professors, professionals, people who have studied it. They know business or whatever subject matter at hand because they have studied it extensively. And they can teach you. Then you have experience experts. These are people who have worked directly with the expert and know how they did it. Once again, they can teach you. But then you also have the application expert. And this is someone who has actually accomplished what you desire to accomplish and lived through all the problems that you're experiencing getting there. So it's T. And interesting, most people say, oh, I need the application expert. And there's a lot to that. That's where your mentors come in. Um, It's also should be where your coaches come in. But he says that the best expert you can ever hire is someone who is experienced in all three. They've studied Mm -hmm. it. They know it inside and out. They've worked with the best in the industry, and they have accomplished it themselves. And he said one way to find this out is to ask people, where did you make your money? So if they made their money teaching, they're a theory expert. If they made their money working for someone, they're an experience expert. If they made their money actually building it, they're the application expert. And you want someone who's made money in at least two or all three of those areas. So that kind of wraps up our breakdown of the difference between mastermind, coaching, mentor, and accountability partner, and our opinion on those, how they've helped us throughout our life, and which ones we think that every business person should have. Mm -hmm. So our question for you today is, are you using any of these? Do you have an accountability partner, a mastermind, a coach, or mentors? And if not, is it something you're seriously considering doing for yourself and your business? Hop on over to howbusinessreallyworks.com and you can answer those questions in the comments to this episode or you can contact us through the contact page. We would love to hear from you. Yes, and don't forget to like this episode and share this episode. And if you are listening to us in iTunes, please don't forget to give us a review. That will help us be found in iTunes and that in turn will help us help more people like you to succeed in their businesses. So share, comment, like, and give us a review and we will see you on the next episode. Thanks everybody.